Okay. Yeah, it's a few minutes past two, so I think we can kick off. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I've had a few sound issues today, so that's why I'm holding my mic right up to my lips, um, but I'm, I'm hoping it's going to work okay um, for the next hour. Um, so welcome. Um, my name is Claire Jacob, and I'm the Communications Hi, and Nina. Partnerships Manager Thanks at so the much. Serene Capital Partnership. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our first ever Conversations with Climate Leaders um, event, which today is focusing on climate literacy. Um, before we get started, just a couple of practical, practical things. Um, so you'll have noticed we are using Zoom webinar today. That means you're not going to be able to see each other's faces, um, unfortunately, but you will be able to see our lovely panel. Um, and please do still use the chat, fun chat function to introduce yourself, to make any comments or reflections. Um, if you have any questions, because there will be time to ask the panel uh, questions, um, please do use the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So you can add your questions there and everyone can also vote for their favorites um, in case uh, we don't have time for them all. Um, so a quick intro to the partnership for those that um, don't already know about us. Um, we're a network of over a thousand organizations in the Bristol region that want to see a zero carbon socially just city where all our nature and communities thrive. One of the um, major projects that we've been uh, running for the last couple of years is the Climate Action Programme. Now that programme aims to support organisations of all kinds to reduce their emissions through offering events, creating res resources and offering opportunities for organisations to learn from each other. And I think my um, my colleague will put a, a post to that in, in the chat. So do have a look. There's a library of lots and lots of different resources freely available now on a range of topics. As part of the Climate Action Programme, we set up the Climate Leaders Group, which is a peer support group for organisations that are leading the way on climate action. And there should be a link for that coming in the chat as well. Um, and the idea of for this group is for those organizations to share their experience, to um, explore solutions to common challenges, and really try and work together to um, progress their climate, climate goals. But for us, one of the really important things about the group is also sharing that experience with the rest of the city. Um, so that the knowledge and experience of members of the group can really benefit other organizations as well. And this is why we decided to start these conversations with Climate Leader events, um, which we really hope will be a way of sharing the experience of members of the group. Because um, after all, with um, this big you know, climate challenge that we're facing, there's no point in everyone reinventing the wheel. So we've decided to start with climate literacy as a top topic because we realize that several members of the group have, have made it a real focus of their work. And we also really believe that there's huge power in um, equipping staff with more, more knowledge in order to empower and motivate them to take action. And it can be a really critical part of climate action work at organizations. So I'm delighted to be able to do that today. And we have Nina Skibala, um, Senior Consultant at Turner and Townsend and one of the co-chairs of our Climate Leaders Group here to um, chair a panel discussion with uh, Nico from Bristol Old Vic, Catherine from Bristol City Council, Alan from Watersheds and Andy from Avison Young. So hopefully we're going to get the experience and perspectives of quite different organisations from different sectors and different sizes. Um, so yeah, I hope it's going to be a really interesting um, event and I'm going to pass over to Nina. Oh, you're still on mute, Nina.
there's always one, isn't it? You think after how many, you know, three years into using Zoom that uh, I'd remember to come off mute. So first of all, uh, thank you, Claire, for that lovely introduction to what I think is going to be a really fascinating uh, discussion today. So as we all know, we're here to, and to talk about uh, climate literacy and understanding from uh, what the, the approaches that uh, Bristol Old Vic, Captain Young, Bristol City Council and Watershed are taking uh, to embed that through that organisation. And I think, you know, what I think it's really important, I can see that's why so many people have come to join us this afternoon is the idea around how do we engage or maybe activate our employees. I mean, it's great that we've got, we've got uh, these four interesting speakers joining us today, but they are just one person within their organisation. So it's going to be really interesting to find out how do they leverage their, um, their colleagues to also act on climate change. What's quite introduction, in, in, in what's quite uh, um, interesting is that when we're talking about climate change, quite often we can become very fixated on technological um, solutions. So quite often it's 95% of our attention is on, you know, what sort of technologies are going to help save us uh, to address climate change. But behaviours is an important is an important part. It, apparently it's up to 50% of those potential savings we can do without doing anything different technologically. It's just by doing behaviour change and putting those technologies in place. When we do combine that with behaviour change, those savings just become so much bigger. Now, as a group of organisations and businesses, we're going through a period of time where, you know, investing in capital programmes becomes more challenging. We're in a cost of living crisis, that energy crisis. So when we know how to engage with our employees, that means we are able to do things maybe that are on a lower budget or things that we can hopefully deliver a bit quicker as well. And it was interesting to see that uh, there was an ED um, uh, survey of companies recently and it shows that you know of all of the things that companies are currently looking to do in terms of energy efficiency and sustainability um, investing in energy efficiency is number one but the close second then is looking at that behavior change so that's enough from me I'm going to now open up the floor to uh, our brilliant panelists and I guess the first question I'm going to have is you know what is climate literacy and why is it um, important or why is it become why is it important for your organization to engage with it so if I direct that question first of all to Catherine uh, I'd love to hear how your approach is at Bristol City Council. Thanks Nina um, yeah interesting question I think the the literacy element has has come about largely because of the organization carbon literacy um, that, that probably coined that term carbon literacy um, and I think we've picked it up and, and taken it in our probably different directions and looking forward to hearing what others have done with it um, and I think probably at its heart the idea is to uh, to give people enough knowledge and skills to be able to take action and that's really the approach that Bristol City Council uh, wanted to take um, so after the, the council declared a climate emergency in 2018 uh, and shortly following that um, produced uh, um, the mayor's climate emergency action plan and one of the major commitments there was to um, to train um, councillors, city leaders and council staff uh, so that they were able to take climate change into consideration in everything that they did. So that's, uh, that's what I got brought on to do in 2020, um, which was an interesting year, as you'll remember. Um, I had just started when we went into lockdown. Um, and uh, so, and also the council is, as you mentioned, different sizes of organizations is possibly about uh, around 6,000 people working for the council, all doing different things, different levels of access to computers. Um, some of them, you know, lots of people are out and about. Um, so it's quite a challenge in a way to think of something that would um, be enabling for that kind of a, a cohort group of people. So um, we've taken a sort of multi-pronged approach. There's quite a few different things that we do. Um, but one of the main things is an e-learning package called Climate Change Awareness, which is mandatory now for all council staff. 
um, and we're enrolling um, divisions at a time, so about a thousand people every month since January. Um, and around 1500 have completed it so far. Um, and we've enrolled about 4,000. So we're, we're in the process of, of, yeah, getting everybody through that, uh, that sort of initial training. Um, that's on the back of, it. so that, that package has been available, although we uh, sort of edited it this year um, in January. Um, it's been available since 2020, um, but voluntarily. So it's, it's this year that we made that mandatory. Uh, alongside other workshops that we've been running as well. So we did run carbon literacy for counsellors uh, in 2021. Um, and uh, we've a variety of other workshops as well. I run something called Leading Sustainably. And then we're working with particular groups uh, who have um, perhaps the bigger challenge, but also the bigger opportunity. So for instance, housing development, uh, working closely with them with a built environment professional to look at. This, the particularities of how this can be taken forward, uh, for instance, in, in buildings. So that's that's maybe a bit of a, a nutshell of, of what we've done so far in Bristol Council. That's that's brilliant. That's a great first overview. And I think there's lots to pick, hopefully pick out from that as well. So how do you roll that out to a large organisation and what sorts of interventions do you provide for different roles? And it would be great to pick, maybe pick up with you in a bit about switching from voluntary training to sort of that mandatory side. So thank you very much. Um, over to you, Nick, uh, Nick and Nico. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what your role is at, Bris at Bristol Ulvik and what is it, what is it about um, carbon literacy and climate literacy that you're looking to do at the theatre? Yeah, so, um, well, thanks a lot for, for having me here. Um, I'm the environmental consultant for Bristol Vic and I mainly work identifying our potential as a, an arts and culture organization, but also community hub in, in inspiring positive change while we also reduce our own environmental impact. Um, and the need for, for carbon literacy was identified because we were encountering some challenges around the way we wanted to implement certain environmental initiatives or, or when we were getting very far ahead with, with trying to, to look at the way in which we produce shows or finding different production models for, for the way in which we do work. And we realized that perhaps we were not all on the same page when having those conversations, that there was a, a very clear need to, to level up those skills and to share a common awareness uh, of what those carbon impacts and costs are, you know, of all the activities that we, that we do as professionals, as an organization, but also to look at what our real ability and motivation to reduce them is. Um, although we are a small organization in comparison to, for example, the, the example that we just had from, from the council, we, we only have about 60 core staff, but then we work with a very large number of freelancers and, and other creatives as well. And, but simultaneously, we do engage with a very large number of, of audiences and visitors and stakeholders, and there's a, a huge potential in there. So we conducted um, a survey, or one survey for our staff and another one for audiences to try to understand a little bit um, where we were standing with this with this issue and how much we are understanding the words of, of some of the vocabulary and the challenges. Like, for example, what does it mean to establish that a show or a production is carbon neutral? For example, what, what does that really entitle and what, what, what does it mean? What will we need to do to achieve so? And, and not take those terms lightly and actually really dive in what that means and the process behind that. Um, so after recognizing that there was a, a need for that, um, we liaised with the Carbon Literacy Project, it's an organization based in Manchester. And through them and with their support, we have created a course, we developed a course um, and we accredited that course with them. So um, we, we have that reassurance of having met a criteria that's been established by them, but simultaneously allows us to certify everyone who we invite to those sessions. Um, so it, it's been a quite interesting journey. We've now delivered about 10 sessions here um, and we have trained about uh, 60 plus members of staff, but uh, the aim and the reason why we approach it in, in this way is because we want to embed it in the long term. So we want to get sure that when we have new starters or we have new creative teams or new companies that we work with in the future, um, this course can be passed on from people to people and, and building that sense of empowerment and ownership of the course um, as opposed to being a one-off or, or something that uh, could be very good, but then not necessarily 
uh, become systemic in the way we approach this. And we want that coherence to, to remain. And the good news is that we also are sharing that course with other theatres across the country. Um, so we have created a course that uh, has a, a quite solid structure, but then has certain bits of the course that can be adapted by different venues to, to make it relevant for their context. And we share an ecosystem of, of freelancers and professionals in the art sector in the UK. And we want to ensure that we are involving everyone in this journey and that we make this resource as available and as affordable as we can. So we're very happy to confirm that uh, Nottingham Playhouse, for example, has now begun delivering training sessions using our resources. And we have colleagues from Plymouth coming over to train here to take the course with them. Um, so it's a very collaborative approach in that sense. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that introduction and very interesting to hear that uh, the way that uh, Bristol Old Vic is rolling that training out to its um, to its staff and embedding that right at the start to in include it into an in its induction and also working right across the sector. So I think we've got lots of interesting questions to pick to you in a little bit as well. Um, next, I'm going to pop over to Andy Smith from Averson Young. And yeah, Andy, like what Nico did, he's going to give us a quick introduction to you and your role at Averson Young and explain to us a little bit what you're doing in terms of uh, climate literacy within your organisation. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me along. Um, so, yeah, I, I work for Averson Young. For those who haven't heard of us, uh, we're a corporate real estate advisory uh, company. Uh, we have offices in Bristol, but also pretty much every major city up and down the country. Um, I'm the environmental manager leading on our net zero carbon commitment. So back in 2020, we committed to be net zero by 2030 for our UK business. Um, so that really focused minds on how we can go about uh, making the changes to the business to reduce our carbon emissions. Now, we, are, as a business, we're an occupier, so we don't own any buildings. We just we we rent them uh, often in multi-tenanted locations. So our our opportunity to reduce our carbon emissions was 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 quite limited in terms of controlling the buildings, controlling the plant, and the equipment that's in there. Um, but that's not to say our carbon footprint is small. Um, as for most businesses your carbon footprint probably sits within, most of it sits within scope three. So ours is over 90% and most others are probably similar. Um, and that's things like your purchase goods and services and uh, business travel and commuting and things like that. And we can, some te technological improvements can be put in place, but one of the big changes we, we, we realized that we could make was with behavior change and helping people to understand their, their, their carbon impact within that, within the scope three and, and within the value chain. So we, we engaged with uh, the Carbon Literacy Project uh, and um, linked up with some smaller, a, a small organization up in Manchester who worked with us to develop the, the program and got it approved by the Carbon Literacy Project. And over 18 months, um, we were rolling that out across our business on, on a mandatory, uh, sorry, on a voluntary basis. We didn't want to go down the route of mandatory. Uh, and um, we, we initially targeted, we thought the people that would be a bit more engaged to it. So we have a, we have a leaders um, group and we have a, a sustainability leaders group. So we targeted them in the first instance who could then undertake the, the leadership um, of, of the training and then be able to sort of escalate and promote it throughout the business. And the uptake has been fantastic. Uh, we've had nothing but positive feedback from it. And um, some of the people just getting more engaged. Um, and we've, we see it really important. We see it as a really important um, opportunity, not only for uh, our staff uh, to be able to understand their own carbon footprint, but help, help the business improve their carbon footprint. But also we have uh, a lot of clients, so we can take that to our clients as well. So we were able to say to them, we're, we're trying to improve our carbon footprint, which is part of your carbon footprint as well. You're on mute, Nina. Done it again. So <laughs> thanks for that overview there, Andy. That was really interesting. Again, again, common. Th there's a bit of a common theme coming here uh, with the Carbon Literacy Project. And I noticed that I think we've got uh, somebody from the Carbon Literacy Project um, in the in the audience today. So uh, no, that's really interesting. And again, um, 
interesting to hear your approach a bit like what Catherine was talking about that doing things on a voluntary have they started off doing things on that, that voluntary basis and the good feedback that you've been having from people who've been attending those and again how that links with your scope one and two three one two and three emissions as well so for those of you in the audience who might not be uh, as advanced in your net zero or thinking about that so your scope one two and three emissions your scope one emissions is what uh, carbon you emit uh, what sorry uh, emit as a, a for, for, from fossil fuels that you consume so that would be your um, gas in your building or it might be from uh, vehicles that you own scope two that's looking at electricity that you purchase and then scope three as Andy just mentioned there everything else so that's where you put your company puts their pensions in it's what you buy it's what you put out onto the market it's what your landlord does and what everything happens in your supply chain which as you mentioned for an organization like yours that was 90% so yeah you can imagine all of those decisions that your colleagues need to do has that big impact on that scope three emissions right so I'm just going to hand over next to Alan Jones of Alan from the watershed so please introduce tell us a little bit about what your role is within the watershed and again what's the approach you're taking on uh carbon literacy and climate literacy training hello uh thank you Nina thank you everyone else um Oh, my role at Watershed um, doesn't really sound as relevant as everyone else's does now because um, I manage the box office and do the scheduling here at Watershed. But back in 2019, I also um, took over chair of the environmental group, which we have, which is an internal stakeholders group, which has been running since at least 2012. Um, but back in 2019, hot on the heels of Bristol City Council um, and the Culture Declares movement, we declared culture uh, uh, climate emergency at the same time. Um, and from that, we just decided to sort of refocus our attention of what we were doing as the environmental group and really kind of work out how we could just make those huge strides towards that 2030 carbon neutral goal that we'd set ourselves. Um, so in 2019, two of us, myself and a colleague, went up to Manchester, actually. We went to home in Manchester and we did the carbon literacy projects training there in home which is great. So we brought that kind of information back. Um, from that, we then did a survey of all of our staff to try and figure out what everyone thought was really crucial to help us get to our goals. And training came up in our top two or three kind of uh, things we needed to achieve. So um, we decided to use that, that carbon literacy training it seemed like a good thing to actually spread out across the organisation. Because at first we just thought two of us go there, we'll know what we need to know. Get everyone on board actually it just seemed like a much better idea for us to then spread that across the organization um so we developed our own um training we used our experience of going to home in manchester in their fantastic training but also the templates that the carbon literacy project supply we sort of built on those um three of us from the environmental group split the work between us so myself david uh uh, Redfield and um, Zoe Rasbash, who you might well know, she's been probably represented as much more here at the Bristol Green uh, Partnerships. Um, so we split it up between us, created our own sort of sections. We'd regroup every couple of weeks. And then um, finally, once we got to that point where we were ready to share it, we got our most senior members of staff in and we took them for an entire day through our eight hour training session. And going into that, there was, an, uh, there was a belief we were going to do a voluntary system, get people to volunteer to come along to this training. But after that one session, our dry run, that changed. It became mandatory. We found the budget came to us. We were going to uh, get everybody in the organisation to do the training. At the moment, I think we're sitting at 80%. So our story so reflects what Nicholas was talking about. It's, it's amazing. Um, we've done about 10 sessions. We've now scheduled in every six months. We do a session that's scheduled in a year in advance um, where new starters or anyone who sort of managed to slip through the net the first time round comes along. And it's just an established part of um, the mandatory training to, to be a member of the watershed team. Um, yeah. That's uh that's really brilliant, Alan. And I think, do you know what? I love the fact that you say that, you know, your day-to-day -day role it is, wasn't sustainability starting this. And it sort of really shows that, you know, it's it's those power of those green teams or uh, you don't need to necessarily be a sustainability professional to sort of kick off um, these sorts of initiatives in the office. And again, I, what I keep hearing from each of you is, you know, 
carbon, you know, working with the carbon literacy project, um, that working with your colleagues doing those surveys as well. And very interesting, again, that your approach went a bit like what Bristol City Council told us a little bit earlier, went from that voluntary to quite very quickly, I think in your case, um, straight through to mandatory. Um, I just want to like pick out a bit of questions there as well for me. So, so Alan, you know, next bit I really want to understand is how do you get senior leadership to buy into this? Because it's it's an investment in time, training and resources to deliver this. this. So what, how did you get your senior managers on board to back this initiative? Let's <laughs> Less difficult than it might sound. Um, Claire Reddington, who's our CEO, uh, we're very lucky to have Claire Reddington as our CEO. Um, she had a personal interest in this anyway, and she was the driving force to kind of push us towards thinking about um, signing up to the Culture to Claire's movement in the first place. So getting her to come to the session and then getting her to force the rest of the uh, senior team to come along wasn't too difficult. And, and they just really enjoyed it. I mean, we were very sort of deliberate about the way we structured our training. We wanted to not you know, to not just be a, a load of information being thrown at people. I mean, this I mean, this comes from the Carbon Literacy Project as well. They direct you in this way. So we wanted to be engaging. We wanted to mix it all up because it's, it's a full day's training. So there were, you know, there's quizzes in there. There's videos in there. There's a, there's a couple of games in there. There's a few sections where we're just talking about um, generally people's kind of attitudes. It's, it was really just trying to keep it, I suppose, a little bit like what you've aimed for with this session, to keep it not too formal. Um, mm -hmm. and to keep it engaging and um I've almost forgotten what you were asking how did we get them to, yeah they, they just engaged with it immediately they, they loved yeah. it and it really surprised me actually from one of the people that was there because I, I wasn't expecting so much enthusiasm but I think um you know myself and Zoe are the, are the ones that we deliver and she's got so much enthusiasm and that sort of really sort of rubs off on people who are in those sessions and it, it really helps um to, yeah it's just making it engaging Awesome. So that sounds like it's getting that company CEO, the CEO or the leader, having their values tie in with this and yeah. then influencing, like you said, forcing the others along. And that enthusiasm, which I can already see from the way that you're talking to us, you know, it's infectious, I guess, and helps bringing it along. Andy, I, I might just ask you the same question because you work for a more corporate sort of organisation and a far larger organisation. How did that senior uh, buy-in work in at Avison Young? Yeah, similarly to Alan, I didn't. We didn't have much of a challenge actually. Uh, we're we're a very forward-thinking uh, business, and um, our CEO and CEO were driving this from the very top. Um, so there wasn't really much of a sort of an argument to try and get them to buy into it. So uh, our COO was on that on our first uh, session of of the, of the training. Um, with people from sort of up and down the business, so which was which was really get great and it was really engaging. Uh, similarly uh, to to Alan's uh, training, there's lots of games and interaction there and films, um, and but people sort of took a lot from it and really sort of spread the word throughout the business. Um, I think people realizing you know what the carbon footprint of a banana or a beef burger was was quite eye opening for some people. Um, so you know, and, and people have gone away and, and taken a lot from it. Brilliant. So again, it sounds like a very fun, a very fun and engaging approach. And again, you just sort of said it's that CEO or COO getting them involved early on. And as you mentioned, then different sort of people within the organisation. That's really interesting. So I, I'm just going to go over to Catherine uh, from Bristol City Council X because we've heard a lot now about um, people go using the um, carbon literacy training, but it sounds as though you went through a different approach. So you've got an online platform, if I understand correctly. Now, was, was that something that you developed in-house as the council or is it something that you were able to sort of purchase off the shelf? Yeah, so I would echo everyone else's um, comments about carbon literacy. So it was the first thing that I did actually in the council was run a, a live session of carbon literacy um, to kind of pilot it and see how it went. And it did go really well. And, and like everybody says, it you know, the the sort of the, uh, the very interactive style of it and the kind of play like style of it. And it, um, I know is, uh, you know, it's, it's a really appealing way of delivering it and uh, I think it is really good. Um, but you asked earlier about in terms of getting um, getting buy-in for time. And I think I think the issue that we had was because there's so many people working for the council, many of them doing sort of very, 
you know, critical jobs, social care, all sorts of things. Um, taking people out of their jobs to do a day's worth of training was considered to be, you know, a challenge, difficult, you know, difficult really to, to get. Um, and also to make it equitable in, in a way there would be certain people uh, who would be able to take that day to do training, but there's a lot of council staff that wouldn't. Um, and that similarly was behind the the reasoning behind doing it, making it mandatory as well, because although that sounds like we're forcing people to do it, it's actually giving people the opportunity to do it, because in many cases, if it's not mandatory learning, people aren't able to access it because they might be taking time out of their regular role um, that doesn't involve being at a computer to, to do the training. So that was a response to a question you didn't ask me. But the, the question that you did ask me was about, did we develop it in-house? Yes, we did. Um, and the reason for that was, uh, I know Carbon Literacy does have an e-learning package, which I went through and was also good, but was quite long. And um, and also, it, you know, requires um, purchasing for each individual that completes it. So, uh, and also we wanted to be able to update and to, um, modify the content so that it was really relevant to us um, yeah, you know, in, in Bristol City Council. And so um, some of the content in the e-learning is very specific. It's kind of about our own strategies, our climate emergency action plan, um, a little bit of a timeline of action because it's not, you know, the declaration of climate emergency came, you know, a, a decade or so after Bristol had already started working on climate action, Bristol City Council. So, um, there's a little bit of a timeline of action to give people a sense of what's happening, uh, what's been happening already, so that we're not starting from scratch. Um, yeah, so and to be able to update that as well going forward, we we developed it in in house. No, that, that's really that's really interesting. And again, it, it's I'm really glad that you sort of talked about that sort of time it takes because yeah, and you know, for some organisations being able to allow staff out to do a day's worth of training is, is possible and like, as you mentioned having it equ equitable having those shorter sessions uh, can work as well and I think you know I've just been doing a little bit of work on this as well and looking at I think it's John Lewis who's rolled, who's rolled out training or awareness training to um, about 30,000 of their staff and they've used um, an energy aware or another sort of platform that can be uh, bought off the shelf but can be modified um, what I really liked about your answer is that you told said how you linked that with your own climate strategy and you know the things I guess if we're going to be engaging with our employees we want them to be doing things that can have an impact on our own organization and um, Nico I was wondering you know if you can talk to us a little bit about what what sorts of outcomes have you seen in the staff that have gone through um, this sort of training that have been linked then to your own net zero targets yeah, well, um, first of all, I guess uh, knowledge is power and, and empowering individuals is, is kind of building action. So uh, what we identify, and, um, and for those who don't know, and, and when you use the Carbon Literacy Project kind of uh, templates and, and, and guidelines, um, individuals are invited to fill in a form at the end of each section, which has uh, two action pledges. One is an individual action pledge, and the other one is a collective action pledge. Um, and those in, in the context of the workspace should be work-based action pledges. So what we're discovering uh, through this is that as opposed to um, us having to scope all of the areas of our business that perhaps we don't have the capacity at the moment to do in terms of some of the actions that we could do to improve, what we are already seeing with only two months in from the first sessions that we have delivered is that loads of initiatives and actions are being put in place in different departments without necessarily those coming from the environmental working group or coming from our policy. So what we're identifying is that our new action plan and policy, which we're in the process of updating, is actually being informed by the actions proposed by individuals. Which is a very interesting, uh, which is a very interesting way of going around it because it's helping us to identify things that perhaps were not within our radar, or even identify things that we were already doing that we were not aware of, or the environmental benefits of some actions in place that we haven't thought about. Um, so basically, the the main benefit we're finding is that we're not waiting for policy and action plans to actually do something. 
and we are just being flooded with initiatives and actions happening at different levels. And because of the way in which that's happening, people do go and get signed off from the line managers. We, we preempt this, we plan for this. So line managers and senior management team have been aware that they were gonna be approached by all of the teams with initiatives um, to get sure that those things are realistic and don't impact the business in a negative way. And, but what we're seeing is action. We're not waiting, we're not, necessarily waiting for a formal process to lay things out and those things are happening so then we just have to set key performance indicators for those actions but we can capitalize a lot on the things that are coming out of the training itself without necessarily having to do much more than just enabling individuals so that is uh, really really good and something else um, being a culture organization our conversations with our audiences are very important to us and, and, and the dialogues that take place in our building or after people come and, and enjoy a show here or, or they come for an activity. And um, we're also running our survey before and after each of the sessions that we're also discovering is that individuals working at Bristol Vic feel also more uh, capable of communicating what we're doing to people. So we're also expanding on our spheres of influence and our possibility to inspire others by ensuring that every single member of the team is able to talk about this, is able to, to communicate the things that we are getting right, the things that perhaps we're not yet getting right, and, but there is knowledge and that is happening across the organization, not just on the website or not just on, a, on the senior management team, but there is a, there is a shared uh, ability to talk about those things. Um, and finally, um, we are also identifying opportunities that go beyond environmental issues. Or, or beyond carbon savings. And, and, and that it has been very uh, reassuring and very inspiring and also is helping us um, see also the, the bright side of this and not just focus on the doom or, or just focus on, on, okay, we have to do this because it's the right thing or we have to do this because um, policy is driving us to do it or because the Arts Council is asking us to do it. But it's also an opportunity for us to become more efficient. It's also an opportunity for us to address certain inequalities. It's an opportunity for us to, to rethink the way we do things. And, and that has been very interesting, the amount of, um, of things that come out of the sessions that are just seem like better ways of doing some of the things that we do. And that feels uh, very encouraging and, and positive beyond ultimately uh, the, the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And, and that encourages more senior buy-in and is really positive. So that's, that's, that's really great to hear. So it really sounds like you've unleashed your, um, your colleagues to kind of come up with their own ideas and that they really are taking action and initiative. And it's amazing to hear that that's, that's, that's going beyond just carbon and probably, you know, looking at wider sustainability. I was really interested to hear that you've also got KPIs. So I guess that's very important then so you can measure that impact of, of what you're doing. Um, just thinking about how do you inspire and unleash that I, those ideas. Andy, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about, you know, how there's lots of games and videos and interactivity in the way that you um, deliver the training or deliver this in, in your in with in with your colleagues. I don't suppose you can just talk us through maybe an example of one of those games that or um, interactivity things that you do with your staff. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I suspect uh, many of us uh, I'll say around the table do something similar, but um, I, I touched on it before and it was about identifying uh, the carbon footprint of sort of everyday items and trying to see if people can understand what the carbon footprint is. And, uh, you know, I can't recall what the list is, but, you know, there's a, there's a banana on there, there's a burger, there's a cheeseburger, there's a veggie burger. Um, and lots of other different items and um, you know you have a little breakout sessions and people can talk amongst themselves and try and identify what they feel has got the uh, the largest carbon footprint and then after a short while we make everyone feel guilty because they're they're eating the most carbon intensive item on the list um, but I think it, it as a as a sustainability professional in the in the, in the business for, for 20 odd years I when I did that um, it, so it still sort of opened my eyes, you know, because I perhaps got a, bit, a little bit uh, blinded by some of the some of the some of the smaller things. Uh, I've been focusing on the bigger picture, so it sort of brought it back to me a bit more about sort of my everyday sort of behaviour. And um, yeah, so if it's if, if it's dairy, 
it's really bad. That's all you know. That's all I can say. Beef and dairy is 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 really not good. Uh, so that fact that was really engaging for people. Uh, and then a few of the things we've got within the training is you know we start off with a bit of doom and gloom. You know about the one and a half degrees. We we'll go above that. You know we're we're really in trouble. Uh, there's a bit of a tear jerking moment in there. We've got David Attenborough's. Um, uh, program uh, about climate change and there's a a lone orangutan on a on a on a jcb um so it really does sort of um hit home with a lot of people uh, and has really helped them sort of think about their their impact um and you know they are so vital uh the, the staff are so vital for us um for, for making that making those changes yeah that that's that's brilliant and I, I thank you for sort of bringing that to life and i could see some nod nods around amongst the other participants uh there so it sounds as though you sort of do sort of very similar things so we're, we're coming up almost to the end it's kind of gone really quickly but i was just going to go through and just maybe ask you all very quickly to share maybe your top tip or your lesson learned for anyone else that's on this call with us today or watching this back again that they can uh, use if they're looking to do this within their organisation. So I'm going to come to you first, Alan Jones. What's your top tip? I actually wrote a list of my top tips uh, earlier and I'm just trying to find it now to see which one I'm going to pick out as my number one. Um, I mean, one of my top tips, actually, which is going to upset Catherine a little bit, was um, don't do online training because we tried that and it really didn't work for us. But it sounds like you've got a, a much better plan than we had. We tried to convert our in-house training to online and that was a bit of a struggle because uh, maybe we hadn't thought it through properly. So that's not going to be my top tip. Um, I'm going to say uh, leave time. Um, so it's something we discovered because our first one or two sessions, maybe we'd, we'd planned this full day's training and we'd pretty much filled the full day with training and we struggled to, to, to um, finish everything we wanted to within the time scale that we had. So since then, what we've done is we've we've not only scaled it back a little bit. So there's, there's less content um, to, to open up more space for those discussions, because that is the most important part of the day, really. It's more important than anything else is to in, ignite those conversations and get people talking to their colleagues and their peers. And quite often with us, it's people that don't normally work together. So it's really useful because you get different perspectives. And because we I, I don't know how much people know about what we but it's a very it's very complicated complicated organization much more than most people outside realize we've got studios we've got kitchens we've got cinemas we've got a box office we've got office based stuff we've i mean we've got um all sorts of different people in the same space so there's lots of different perspectives and ideas so making sure there's that space and being able to there's little pieces in there that we've got now that are earmarked that like okay we took an extra half hour maybe on that than we weren't expecting to we can just quickly cut that out because it's not as important and keep that space for later on in the conversations so that's my top tip brilliant alan and that's a great great reminder just to remind that you know we are discussions are so important and we're going to be going through and see that lots of questions have been asked and we'll be coming to your questions as well in a bit so um catherine very quickly what's your top tip from your experience um i would say and it's it's uh ties into something alan said earlier about working with colleagues and uh, and bringing different people together i think um if you're planning on rolling out some kind of training program, draw on the existing network of people, either internally or externally. Uh, you know, it's so useful to hear from other people, even in this context, what you've been doing, what's been working. And I had the same sort of discussions with other local authority um, people doing climate training to see what people, what other people were doing and what was working for them or not working. And, uh, you know, it's, it's invaluable, really, just the network of connections and having those conversations. So, yeah. Um, Brilliant. tap into your networks excellent so that's it great top tip uh nico very quickly what's your top tip for i think it's, i think it's about creating a safe space so on one hand to okay, sure there's no like shame and blame and it's not a place to to discuss pe people's choices up to that point it's a place to to inspire people um so on one hand remove the element of individual choices and and and, and feelings of blame or shame within them but then also ensuring positivity um, because negativity doesn't encourage any action. So being very careful with that sense of doom, and this is something that the Carbon Literacy Project, I think, stresses quite a lot. Um, and, and yeah, try, try and every time you can and every opportunity to, to see the right side of things is, is very important. Brilliant. That's, that's great, great advice there. And Andy, 
would you like to share your tip please? yeah i just got to say to alan we did all as online uh we had no choice because there's a pandemic on so uh uh so but it worked really well actually um but uh yeah my top tip um I guess it depends on the nature of your organization. So for us, the vast majority of our staff are client facing. So to try and commit them to a day's worth of training was quite challenging. Um, so we'd get, I always aimed for about 25 people on each training session, uh, but there would often be people dropping out because they've got client commitments and, and et cetera, et cetera. So I would say, depending on whether you mandate it or not, and the nature of your business, I would look to perhaps go like bite size um maybe two or three modules that can be completed over a, a month or so rather than sort of doing it in one day brilliant that's that's really great and i think yeah, great to hear from different very different organizations different sizes different sectors so thanks thanks so much for that so this leads us nicely into sort of the question and answer section so i've just opened the, them up and it's thank you for the participants there for the attendees today for putting up their questions so I'm going to put forward um, the question that Lewis Lillipat has put through. So they're from uh, the NBT. Now they've asked uh, panelists if they could give a sense of, you know, has this, uh, have they been able to help make their um, workforce more climate literate or were they already at quite a high level? And also they're just wanting to find out how do they move those people on who might be more from a place of um, means, um, I can never say this word, <laughs> uh, set, set, uh, set, <laughs> not suspicious, or, or people who don't want to engage with it, how they've been able to, to um, overcome those barriers. So if I maybe go to um, Alan first, how would you? Uh... I, we expected, um, we'd, we'd earmarked a couple of people we thought might be more sceptical and more challenging, but it, it hasn't happened. In all honesty, it's just not happened for us. Um, so I can't really answer that one. I, I don't know because we haven't had to face that challenge. Um, are people more aware? Um, I don't know. I think they probably were pretty engaged before. I think what we've really gained from doing the training is, is an understanding that people's views and opinions and ideas are important and giving people the confidence to come forward and share those um giving people the confidence to know that as an organization we genuinely are committed to this and it's a, it's a genuine goal it's not just lip service it's not just us trying to make sure we get our funding it's not any of that it is a genuine thing that we want to do um and i think people feeling that positive and genuine energy it's made people more engaged how much they've learned i mean yeah they probably learned some of the science because you know they may not have covered that you know we show a few videos on that explain a bit of it and talk a bit about the maths but i think generally people's understanding was already there i think it's 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 about those conversations and that understanding of the importance not just to the planet but to us as an organization i think that's brilliant Thanks. And I think I'll probably put that question as well to Catherine, just thinking that you can, you know, you're a, such a large organisation. Um, surely not everybody, you know, might be already on board or wanting to do this sort of training. So how have you overcome that? Or how do you, how do you, and also, how do you deal with it when, um, you know, that we don't, somebody spoke a bit, a bit about not bringing shame into it. So if people have got conflicting views, how's that been dealt with within the council? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'd say, like Alan, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, general scepticism or unwillingness and much less than I anticipated, especially, you know, we when the climate climate change awareness e-learning was uh, voluntary, about 300 people completed it voluntarily and the feedback was really good. Um, and when we were going to make it mandatory, I was like preparing myself for the like, you know, the backlash of uh, people are going to be so, you know, you know, it was just I didn't know what the response would be. And I've been really pleasantly surprised in that, you know, there's over 1500 people have completed it. And there's very few um, comments that I would say uh, are I mean, and they're not even, it's not scepticism, it's just it will be, you know, on particular points, um, uh, which might lean over into another question here, but it'll be particular points about maybe what the council is or isn't doing, uh, some some other some other element of the council, you know, we're, we're all doing this and we're all enthusiastic, but what about this thing that the council still is doing or isn't doing, et cetera? 
Uh, so some things like that coming through. Um, so I wouldn't say broadly very, very little skepticism about climate change uh, or, um, or even resistance to having to do mandatory climate change learning. Like hardly any, most people are very positive, very keen, you know, uh, even more like this is great. So glad everybody's doing it. Um, yeah, uh, and does it build on? Yeah, so I think I think it builds on that definitely. That people are very open um, on the whole in the council to doing this training. Um, yeah, that's good. So it sounds as though there's it, it, it sparks a dialogue, uh, possibly challenges the organisation as well on, on what they're doing. Um, great. So I think the next question I'm going to put forward, and this is a question that's got uh, four thumbs up. So this is Jessica Farrow from 12. Now she's been asking the panellists if maybe you can describe a little bit more detail about what's the content of the uh, carbon literacy training and how much does it focus on science and things like social justice and the emotional side of um, climate issues. And, you know, I think somebody mentioned earlier on, is it Alan, you talked about having that space to have those discussions um, and how do you deal with eco-anxiety and and grief. So um, Andy, would you be happy to take that question? Yeah, I'm happy to start, certainly. Um, well, the, the the Climate Literacy Project have a sort of a, a, quite a, I could say strict, a strict syllabus around what the training must entail uh, and, and how it's delivered. Um, so I I think like the vast majority of us around, around here uh, on the screen is that we start off with the science and why we're doing it um all, all the sort of policy drivers um we have also in, we've tailored our training as well to be corporate real estate focused as well so we could relate to our employees uh, not not to say there's anything wrong with the general sort of e-learning package that's available by the carbon literacy project but we just wanted it to feel a bit more relevant to our, to our employees um so then we talk about a bit more of the impacts of climate and carbon upon the corporate real estate industry so they can sort of relate it to their day-to-day -day activities and, and then there's a bit more learning and fun and games uh, before you sort of get into the sort of the pledging side of it um, which some people did have a bit, bit of a struggle with and I think perhaps um, started to feel a bit guilty about some of the things they were doing day-to-day -day and how they could perhaps try and reduce their carbon carbon impacts. Brilliant. And that, that, that leads quite nicely maybe to the final question, got one minute left. It, it's how do you, you know, how do you deal with that um, feeling of possibly judgment when you're going through this course? And maybe uh, Nico, if you'd like to take that, you know, how did you, how have you dealt with that at the theatre? Um, yeah, so there is a, there is a lot, I think, adding on, on also what Alan was saying earlier, I, I think it's, it's also an opportunity to, to show the commitment that we have as an organization. And the important thing there is also to be transparent about the things that we might not be getting right and, and, and be transparent about what we're trying to achieve as opposed to, to, to just what those actions are. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the way we identify those, I think the best thing to do is acknowledge those challenges and acknowledge those difficulties as opposed to you know try to avoid falling into those topics or we also have a quite sector specific training we talk about some of the resources that are available for for theater more specifically and and inevitably that worries people because we are proposing a massive change to the ways in which our sector has been working for, for decades and and what I suggest is as opposed to kind of running away from the problem is almost like the first thing we do is kind of addressing those issues and flagging, okay, this might not be easy because it's very understandable to, to encounter a massive challenge in, in changing the way we do things, but acknowledge that and, 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 and bond with that challenge as opposed to, to avoid it and, and just follow the, 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 the paper and the way in which that looks very nice on the slide and actually open the room and, and talk about what those challenges are, what could we do to improve it, um, open open the room for questions, get feedback after the session and, and embrace the difficulty um, because this is a journey that is, is, is full of challenges. It's, it's, it's nothing, there's nothing easy about it. Um, so, so addressing that and, and, and bonding with that will probably lead to, to a more um, positive relationship with it. Brilliant. Well, thank you. That thank you very much. Uh, that that I'm going to hand it back over to Claire in a moment. But before I do so, just a, a huge thank you to all of our panelists for giving us such a wonderful overview of um, what uh, 
uh, climate and carbon literacy means and the approaches that, you that you've all taken. And it's really great to hear lots of similarities in your approach, but also some of those differences as well. And I think that I know certainly I've taken things I think I can take back into my own organisation and those that I work with. And hopefully everyone there in the chat has been able to do the same as well. And again, thank you. I'm afraid we couldn't get through to all of those questions, but hopefully uh, we've been able to address some of those points um, as we've gone through those, those answers as well. So I think we could have easily filled yet another hour um, going through all of those questions. So do use the chat to share any insights as you've already been doing. So I'm gonna now um, hand over to Claire, who's going to close off the session. I, yeah, th thanks so much, Nina, and, and just to also extend my thanks to you and um, everyone, all the panellists for, for taking part. I, I really, I think it's so important to be able to have this type of sharing and to hear the real kind of practicalities of what organisations are doing on the ground and hopefully to give some inspiration that real efforts are going on and sometimes that that's not already always seen so um yeah I've really loved hearing from you all today um I just want to uh, close by sharing a few events that we've got uh, coming up so next week we've got our regular green mingle at the Bristol Beacon on the 1st of June from half five till seven which is a great opportunity to just meet people who are working in or interested in um, the environment in Bristol. And we're also gonna have colleagues from Weka coming along to talk about their low carbon business support program. Um, and links to that will go in the chat along with everything I'm about to share. Um, so the second thing is we've got a, a big event all around just transition on the 13th of June. It's a full afternoon event at the Trinity Center. We've got some really great speakers lined up, um, also some um, creative commissions. So we've got some art, local artists coming along as well. So it should be really brilliant and tickets are flying for that. So please do um, book your place. And then what was next? Oh yes, our climate action breakfast focused on behavior change. So that's gonna happen on the 11th of July. Um, so come along, hear, hear from our great speaker about behavior change and there'll also be a light breakfast and a chance to network with other attendees. And finally, we've just opened another round of climate surgeries, um, which is an opportunity for SMEs in the region to re receive free one-to-one um, -one expert support from an environmental consultant for an hour. Um, we had really great feedback from the first rounds from, from all of the organizations that took part. They said it, it really enabled them to move forward with their climate goals. So if you've got any challenges or, or anything you could do with some help with, have a look at climate surgeries. The deadline to apply is the 14th of June. So I think that's it. So just th thanks again to everyone for taking part. Thanks everyone who attended and I hope you all get to enjoy some of the sunshine. Um, bye now. <laughs>